And I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to 2013 NutriCon. Very excited to have you here. Very excited that we have a phenomenal um, faculty and uh, list of content providers over the course of the next two days. Um, for those of you that have been here before, uh, you know we try to encourage networking. Uh, we want you to make the most of the opportunity. There's phenomenal people that will be on the podium and also in the audience. So we really want to encourage that interaction. Um, I want to acknowledge, and I can't see the lights are a little bit bright, but uh, we do have uh, some partners that, uh, that without the, them and their support, we could not produce the NutriCon. I want to acknowledge GoEd, uh, who's partnered with us for the Omega-3 track that will be running today. The American Botanical Council, who's partnered with us for the Botanicals track tomorrow. We'll be starting with our keynote very shortly and then going into our breakout sessions. Uh, lunch today will actually be what we call a progressive lunch, uh, also designed to encourage some networking. So uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. And the weather has cooperated, so that will be an outdoor lunch. We have the neutral ward reception that uh, concludes today. Uh, so hopefully uh, you will all be, uh, be there uh, with us at the, uh, at the end of the day. The keynote uh, will start, as I said, momentarily, and we'll uh, have a concluding keynote tomorrow by Dr. Jeff Bland. Uh, the track chairs, uh, Adam Ismail, uh, Doug Kalman, Jim Tonkin. Um, as I said, I can't see too much in the back of the room. Uh, we've got Nora Simmons, um, Connor Link, Mark Brush, Todd Runstead. Uh, those are the people that will be facilitating our sessions in the breakouts. I do want to acknowledge my entire team uh, at Ingredia and uh, Nutrition Business Journal for the production of this event, and especially the conference manager, her first rodeo, Nora Simmons. So is Nora back there? I, I don't know that she is, but I would like to acknowledge Nora. Okay, uh, we will get rolling, and uh, to do that, I would like to acknowledge um, all of our sponsors uh, and the tabletops that we have outside, but also especially DSM, um, who's been with us for pretty, mu pretty much right since the inception of NutriCon in the New Hope portfolio as a supporter for the education and science that we do try to provide over these two days. So uh, they've been an active supporter. They are a platinum sponsor for both NutriCon and for the Ingredient Trade Show. And it uh, is a great pleasure uh, to introduce Aparna uh, Parikh from DSM Nutritional Products, the Director of Communications. Thank you for your support, and uh, Aparna will be introducing our keynote speaker this morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Aparna Parikh, Director of Communications for DSM Nutritional Products, Human Nutrition and Health for North America. On behalf of DSM, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today and extend a very warm welcome to you all. DSM has supported NutriCon Conference for more than a decade for its commitment to and leadership in science and technology within the health and nutrition industry consistent with DSM's focus. Bright science, brighter living is central to everything we do at DSM. The products we create, the way we work together with our customers, and the aspirations we have. It refers to our commitment to creating products and solutions that make a positive difference to people's lives. I would like to thank the organizing committee at New Hope. A number of people work very hard and are dedicated to making this an exciting and informative conference. At this time, on behalf of both DSM and New Hope, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Rebecca Costa. Rebecca Costa is the author of the acclaimed book, The Watchman's Rattle, a radical new theory of collapse. In it, Rebecca explains how the principles governing evolution cause and provide a solution for global gridlock. The book has been published in 30 countries with over a half million copies sold. She also has her own radio show called The Costa Report. In her riveting keynote speeches, Rebecca offers powerful takeaways on how to make corporations and organizations, whether medical, technical, financial, or educational, better fast adapters, able to thrive in high failure environment, which makes her perfect for today's program cutting-edge content designed to help you stay ahead of competition. 
Besides that, Rebecca is former CEO and founder of one of the largest marketing firms in Silicon Valley. Her clients included industry giants such as Hewlett Packard, Apple Computer, Oracle Corporation, Siebel Systems, 3M, Amdell, and General Electric. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rebecca Costa. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, uh, they give me a clip on mic because I'm Italian, and uh, if you tell me I can't move around and wave my hands, I become mute. Um, I'd like to first thank the uh, conference organizers. Uh, I, I know Nora Simmons' name was uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it's because of her that I was able to get here uh, on my speaking tour. Um, you might be wondering why a sociobiologist is at Nutricon, and um, I'm here to shake things up and challenge you a little bit and kind of get the program going so that we think outside the box, because I think uh, uh, science has a reputation of being the box, <laughs> and uh, nothing could be further from the truth, as we all know, uh, because you are innovators that are uh, in this room today. We're going to start with the big picture, and then uh, as the program goes forward, uh, we'll drill down to uh, more specifics. Um, when I go around the country and, and uh, speak to groups such as uh, the group that's here today, I find that um, sometimes the Q&A session's longer than the presentation, uh, and I'm not going to have that much time to take your questions and answers. In fact, we may not have enough time today to take any of them. So uh, they have graciously arranged for me to be at a table before the Nutra, uh, the Nutra Awards. And so I will be there at 5 o'clock uh, on the fifth floor at the Sunset Deck uh, to sign books and to answer any questions that you have or, or any thoughts that you'd like to share with me. So I wanted to uh, be sure I mentioned that as well. So uh, we're going to get started here. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, and I promise I'm not one of those speakers that's going to make you raise your hand every five minutes or do crazy things, but uh, one of the things I would like uh, you to do for me um, today, just to get the program started, is I'd like you to look deep inside yourself, and let's all collectively have one moment of honesty here. How many people, and I'd like you to raise your hand, have noticed that in the last just five or ten years, things have gotten noticeably more complicated and more difficult. Raise your hand. Okay, I want you to keep, wait, wait, keep your hand up. I want you all to look around the room. Um, this is your therapy. This is your, ther this is your free therapy. Uh, it, you know, for a while my son had me convinced that it was I was just getting older. And he said, you know, Mom, uh, you're just getting older and you're kind of losing control over things. Uh, you, you can't sort data out. You can't use your electronic new apps and so on and so forth. And then at, just as he was finishing that remark to me, we got into an elevator and there was an 18-year-old and she had a smartphone and she looked at my son. She goes, do you know how to turn the music off on this? And I said, no, this has nothing to do with age. So, so you know, we, we live in a time where Verizon is now offering a smartphone with 200,000 apps on it. 200,000 apps. Now, I got news for all of us. We can't handle 200,000 of anything. Um, uh, but, but it's not just the, the technology that's coming at us. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, you know, we've got uh, people going on, you know, people that manage huge pension funds going on 60 Minutes and admitting they're buying really complicated derivatives that they don't understand. Who goes on television and, and on 60 Minutes and admits that they're placing uh, investments in instruments, financial instruments, that they can no longer understand or even assess the risk of? We even have people like Aunt Nancy Pelosi putting her hand on the health care bill. Did anybody see this where she said, I'm really glad we passed it so now we can read it and understand what's in it? So we've got our leaders in Washington, D.C. In fact, we've gotten so far removed from this biological spacesuit and what it can and can't do and what it needs to thrive and do well in the world that we've had to, and I'm embarrassed by this, by the way, we've had to make a law, 
a law to convince people they can't text and drive a two-ton vehicle at the same time. Really? 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 Do we really need a law for that? Well, I guess if we don't understand and we can't reconnect with the fact that we're a living organism and that living organism needs certain things in order to thrive, if we can't figure that out, then the next step is our government has to tell you that you can't drink soda all day. Right? I mean, that's where we're headed. So, so one of the things that, you know, I, I wrote this book about was complexity. It's, it's, we're just overwhelmed by complexity right now. It's accelerating in picoseconds. This is uh, Eric Schmidt. I had the privilege of uh, speaking with him not too long ago, and he happened to mention to me that about every 48 hours we're generating as much data as we did from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. So you see, this isn't an age issue. But biological change, evolution, it, it can require millions of years. We're not going to talk about epigenetics today because just even using that word, people start to wince. But I am going to talk about the normal course of evolution. But here's an interesting question that we should all be asking ourselves. What happens when complexity races ahead of the brain's ability to understand it? What happens when the tax code becomes so complicated that the average person walking the street can't do their own taxes anymore? We become gridlocked. This is the first sign that we're in trouble. When leaders, when experts cannot, can no longer agree, we become unable to fix our problems and we begin passing them from one generation to another as conditions worsen. One of the things we don't do very well at this point in time is understand exponentiation. You can ask very simple exponentiating problems to people and they always get it wrong. We always think we have more time than we do. Every civilization eventually reaches a biological cognitive threshold. I'm going to explain that in just a minute. Why? Because there's two clocks. One way to think about this is one clock is the pace of progress. And every time the hand moves, it's a picosecond. We're generating more data than ever before at a faster rate than ever before. And it's very difficult to know what the facts are and, and which science is good science and which is not. That's why this organization that sponsors this conference is so critical. And that's why I'm here today. But the other clock is the pace at which we develop opposable thumbs and, and we became bipedal. And every time the hand moves on that clock, a million, two million, three million years go by. Now we can argue whether that those two clocks meet today, tomorrow, but logic tells us at some point the two clocks must meet. So it is the uneven rate of change between human biology and complexity that causes a gap to occur. And we are experiencing that gap today. This gap produces three early symptoms. And this is why the book was pretty revolutionary, because we've been able to diagnose three early symptoms prior to collapse. The first is we become gridlocked. We have the solutions. We have the technology. We know what to do to fix our our most dangerous threats, but we can't act on them. In the state of California, we know a catastrophic drought is on its way. We have desalination plants. We can build reservoirs and dams, but we're not acting on them. Instead, we're having a big, giant debate about what to do, and in fact, we're going to just wind up being just like the Mayans. Droughts will devastate us. We don't act on these problems quick enough. The second, is, the second symptom is the more dangerous symptom. There is a mass confusion in the society between what, are, what is an empirical fact and what is an unproven belief. By an unproven belief, I don't mean religious beliefs. I mean anything that cannot be empirically proven. doesn't mean a belief is right or wrong. It just means it's unproven. And then the third symptom which occurs prior to collapse is that policy is based on unproven beliefs and becomes highly irrational. Now, I have an argument back and forth with our leaders in Washington, D.C. about what stage we're at. Some think we're falling off the cliff. Others say, no, we kicked the can of the fiscal cliff down 30, uh, 90 days. 90 days. I couldn't believe we were all patting ourselves on the back uh, over that. But but, but uh, 
apparently that was a victory. Somehow we circumvented that fiscal cliff. You haven't thought about biology maybe for a long time, so I'm going to just put a couple slides up here. The last time we had a major change in human biology occurred when we stood upright. We had an avalanche of new sensory input. Now think about it. All of a sudden we stood upright. We could look across these savannas and we could smell and see our enemies and things that, that posed a threat to us far earlier. But we didn't know what to do with it. We saw the information, but it wasn't intuitive as to what we should do. Should we attack? Should we run? Should we hide? What should we do? So during that period of time, we see a massively fast, rapid growth of the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is basically your CEO of your brain. It makes all your logical decisions for you. Now, in evolution, that was considered a special event. Why was it considered a special event? Because it was fast evolution. It happened over four or five million years, and that's really quick. When people talk about history, and they talk about the history of the United States or the history of the Mayans, I laugh because as an evolutionary biologist, I think about history beginning at single-celled organisms. Now, that, there's the history of the human organism, right? So when civilizations are young, problems are very simple. And they're easily managed by the left and right brain that we've evolved thus far. But over time, problems become more difficult. In your own companies, it's easy to solve 80% of the problems that you have. It's the 20%. It's the 20% that nag on and on and on, and they're complicated. And they begin to look like the kinds of problems that physicists have to deal with. They have lots and lots of variables. They're chaotic models. And one variable changes 0.0001%, and they all change. And those are the problems that are the most difficult to get on top of. They're problems in, in our world like climate change or uh, a global recession. Very, very difficult. But one of the definitions that comes out of Harvard University of complexity is a very simple one. By the way, if you ever see a book that's about complexity, don't buy it. It's too complex. This is one of the things that, that one of the problems I have with anybody that talks about complexity is they make it so complicated we can't do anything about it. But the definition I like of complexity comes out of Harvard University, and it's a very simple one. In a complex environment, you have more wrong choices than you have right ones. And the number of wrong ones are exponentially growing. So in other words, the complex environment that you are all trying to navigate today, that you are all trying to succeed today, is a high failure rate environment. More wrong choices than right ones, and the number of wrong alternatives is exponentially growing. So the odds are growing against you. We want proof of this. One in five medical di diagnoses today is incorrect or incomplete. 1.5 million errors in prescriptions, up to 100,000, and they're predicting maybe it's closer to 250,000 deaths from preventable errors. Now, complexity makes knowledge very, very difficult to acquire. And we have four Vs working against us. You probably have heard this from the Gardner uh, group. Volume, which is there are more people creating more information at, and the second is velocity at a faster rate than ever before. The variety, you've got everything from streaming video, little text messages that people are sending, YouTube, uh, you know, the internet, you've got cell phones and smartphones. You have a whole variety of types of data that you have to deal with and veracity. Of that data, how can you prioritize it? And which data should you be making decisions based on? According to IBM, and this is fresh information, and by the way, the 90% keeps going to 91, 92, 93%. 90% of the information you have available to you is unstructured. It's texts, it's social media, it's all kinds of stuff that's floating around your company, and nobody can put a net out and corral it. But here is why that's dangerous. When complexity makes knowledge or data difficult to attain, we begin that second phase. Remember after gridlock? We start to substitute beliefs 
and, and make decisions based on beliefs instead of facts. In fact, medicine has become so complex that now only about 20% of the knowledge that clinicians use is evidence-based. So what is a belief? I'm saying unproven beliefs. What do I mean by an unproven belief? I mean, one, simply, that it hasn't been proven yet. It may be proven at some point in time, and it may be disproven at some point in time, but we just simply don't know. Second thing is, we like beliefs. We are an organism that really likes to believe things, and I'll tell you why. Because it's cognitively inexpensive. You either believe something's true or you don't. That's it. But to empirically prove a fact, that is a very cognitively taxing uh, and, and expensive and... And, you know, our brains just don't want to work that hard to have to go through all that data to determine what's true and what's not true. I had this experience in the midterm elections. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I found myself disqualified to vote. I, I really did. I, I was looking at all these really complex initiatives, and I realized I hadn't done any due diligence on them. And besides that, they're worded kind of tricky. No means yes, and does anybody else have this problem? No means yes, and yes means no. And so I was standing in the voting booth reading it out loud, and the person next to me goes, be quiet. <laughs> and I said, look, i got to read it out loud because I know how I want to vote, but, but they, they, they worded it in such a convoluted way, I don't know how, uh, how to vote. But, but do you know we, we had this uh, proposition about uh, labeling for uh, genetically modified Foods. And, you know, that was a big thing in California. And, and, uh, and that was complicated. I asked a lot of my friends about it, and they didn't seem to quite understand. They just said, well, we should have it. And I said, well, that's not good enough for me. I need some empirical information, something to back it up with. And by the way, we have beliefs that are small and large. Every time the light turns green and you walk across the street, you believe the traffic's going to stop, Right. You, you don't generally stand there and wait for every car to come to a complete stop before you cross the street. When you put your money in the bank, you believe it's going to be there when you go to write a check. That's a belief. You don't know. One day you may write a check and your money may not be in that bank. One thing we do know about the human organism is that it requires both beliefs and knowledge. There is nothing wrong with beliefs. In order to function, we have to have beliefs. So people like Richard Dawkins who believe that religious beliefs are, are really, you know, uh, caused a lot of destruction and harm, uh, you, know, my, you know what my answer to him is? We've never found any group of humans alive on the planet since the beginning of humankind that didn't nurture beliefs. We drew uh, hieroglyphics to make women more fertile, to catch larger prey. We've always nourished beliefs, large and small. In fact, all scientific discoveries, uh, they start with a belief. We call them a hypothesis, which use a different language. So we do have to have beliefs, but there's a, there's a point at which societies are thriving, they're progressing, they're doing really well, because there's an accommodation for beliefs and empirical facts. We're, we're talented, we can use both, and we do use both. But there is a point at which we make a wrong turn, and our beliefs overtake science. They overtake scientific facts. And I would argue today we have begun to make that dangerous turn. We become susceptible to unproved. Do you know who these people are? I know you know Dr. Oz. Do you know who the other guy is? Anybody? Bernie Madoff. I love this picture because he looks so nice. By the way, the people, he does. I give him my money. By the way, the people who turned over their life savings to Bernie Madoff, those weren't mom and pops. Those were very sophisticated investors who had been in the market for many, many, many years. What would cause them to give, turn over their life savings to this man? Because he said to him, it's too complicated. I'd explain it to you, but you wouldn't understand it. And I have this track record, so I'll tell you what. You just give me your money and I'll take care of it. We have to be very careful because in a society where we cannot tell empirical fact from unproven belief, we become very susceptible to charismatic folks, and we follow, have a tendency to follow false prophets. Don't even get me started about raspberry ketone. You think we might have a problem between beliefs 
and facts. Dr. Oz mentions raspberry ketones one time on his show and there is a massive run by the consumers. And those of you who had raspberry anything in your products lucked out. But we have other kinds of beliefs that are swarming around. People saying, well, we have to put a cap on caffeine. How much calcium intake is good? Chromium is the latest weight loss phenomenon. Did you, did you hear? Oh, you, you guys have all heard about this. Now everybody wants chromium. There's nobody talking about too much chromium might not be such a good thing for you. Everybody wants to lose weight and look younger. Organic versus natural products. Do people really understand that there are nat perfectly natural products that are toxic to the human body? But no, natural everything suddenly has a premium. So we have entered this period of time, particularly in the field that you work in, where there is mass confusion and just a rumor or a spokesperson on television can completely make one product successful and devastate another company. So policy in general becomes shaped by beliefs rather than knowledge and fact. We have other beliefs on a larger scale. We now have 1.8 billion readings of the Earth's temperature, and we know the temperature is going up. But it's very interesting. I go to people like uh, Donald Trump, for example. Uh, Donald Trump was willing to endorse my book, and I'll be really honest, I didn't know if that was such a good idea. Um, because he's such a controversial figure. And, and I went in to meet with him, and he said to me, Costa, this is a great book. It's a fantastic book. Everybody should read it. I'm going to endorse it. But you're wrong about climate change. And I said, well, we have 1.8 readings of, of, of the Earth's temperature. You know, it's going up. And he says, he goes, yeah, I know. And I said, I think what you mean to say is you don't believe humankind is responsible for climate change. And he said, yeah, that's what I said. And I said, no, you said there's no climate change. And he goes, that's what I said. So I said, but Mr. Trump, there's a difference between saying humans didn't cause it and that there's no climate change. And he says, I told you that. So we were pretty much done with that conversation. We, we have beliefs about nuclear power. We have people in, in Washington, D.C. now voting on nuclear power that have never taken a physics class in their life. And I promise you, if they took it, they didn't pass. We have beliefs about war. Who's a threat? Who's not? We have beliefs about labeling. Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you what. Just do yourself a little experiment. Go to a grocery store and pull, pull anything off of the, the counter and, and stand there and say, hey, could you help me to the next person who comes along and say, could you, could you explain this label to me? We're voting on whether we want labels or not, but we don't understand the labels. I'm not really sure if the labels are helpful, but somehow we have the belief that if we make you put a label on, you'll be more responsible and make a safer product. That's a myth. It's a belief. There's no evidence that forcing people to put labels makes them make healthier products, but the consumer believes this. So my suggestion, make the label really long and they'll think it's really good stuff. That would be my suggestion. In 1976, Dr. Richard Dawkins, he called these beliefs memes. And like genes, memes replicate, they mutate, or they grow extinct. Our beliefs either proliferate, like raspberry ketones, overnight they go viral, or over a period of time they eventually become extinct. And as complexity mounts and facts become difficult to acquire, Uber beliefs take over, super memes take over, and they dominate organizations, societies, and individuals. I'm not going to have time to go into the super memes that are in operation today that are in the way of progress, but they are outlined in my book. Irrational opposition, siloing within organizations and industries, a confusion over correlation and causation. How many of you have that argument inside your companies? So I'm going to use an example of all three stages, gridlock, substitution between facts and beliefs, and then the collapse of the civilization because of irrational policy. The Mayans, if you've ever been out to the Mayan ruins, everybody goes out to see the big pyramids, and that's really wonderful, but it's really not the big Mayan story. The big Mayan story is they were amazing hydraulic engineers. 
They knew they, that their society had a very tenuous relationship with water and rainfall. So what they did was they, they built massive reservoirs, unprecedented for their time. They dug out underground cisterns, developed the first refrigeration to put food in these underground cisterns and to keep water from evaporating out of them. They practiced crop rotation, water conservation, and all of that. So uh, there were some man-made remedies, and they were also in tandem practicing fetishism, the sacrifice of human beings and animals in order to make the rain come back. But we see that uh, that 3,000-year uh, uh, civilization, after a couple thousand years, we see them start to make that turn where they get confused about empirically-based solutions and belief-based solutions. So what happens is, is they stop building the reservoirs. They don't think that will work anymore. No more underground cisterns. No more crop rotation, no more water conservation. They begin to escalate fetishism. So what do they do? At first, they're, they're murdering captured slaves. Then they move to their own people. From their own people, they move to young virgins. They go from the infirm to, the, to young virgins. And just prior to the Mayan collapse, because of drought, warfare, disease, they were murdering newborn infants, unspoiled newborn infants, as a solution to drought. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, we're not doing that. No, no. As a species, we're not murdering newborn infants as a solution to drought. But we are flying airplanes into buildings as a solution to our problems. So that kind of irrationality begins to take hold of a civilization, and it begins to be the precursor for irrational policy and eventually collapse. We now know the stages. Super memes thwart empirically-based progress. That's why coming to conferences like this, and by the way, I'm not a spokesperson for Nutricon, but I will tell you, coming to conferences like this where you can get empirical data, where you can network with other people who have scientific fact is really, really critical. So first, complexity produces gridlock. Second, beliefs replace facts, and super memes dominate, and decisions in public policy become irrational. This is a quote from my mentor, Dr. Edward Wilson out of Harvard. We live in a time where we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and it's a dangerous situation. You put all those things in a blender, and what do you have? But we're not done yet. If the fallout from a cognitive threshold is not our only evolutionary challenge. We are not born blank slates. We inherited some traits that were useful to our survival many, many millions of years ago, but they're not very useful to us today. Competition versus cooperation, aggression, violence, greed, hoarding, attraction to high-calorie foods. I only mention this because I have discovered recently that I am the descendants of extremely good high-calorie-seeking organisms. I have. If you have a buffet out and you have fruit and and carrot sticks, and, and, and then you got pizza and donuts. My hand's going for the pizza and donuts. Now, I'm an educated woman. I should never eat a donut again the rest of my life. There's no excuse for it. But I want it. I want it, and I, and I, I have this conversation with Oprah. I said, listen, there was a reason we want high calories, because calories in nature are very difficult to come by. And, though, and in earlier times, those who, who succeeded in identifying high calories and laid around and didn't waste calories when they didn't need to look for food or defend themselves, those were the survivors. Their genetic material propagated. Those people that were skinny and they ran and they, and, and, and they, and they ate carrots, their DNA didn't all make it, not in my tribe. They didn't make it. Now, in other tribes, they were faster to get away from enemies, and maybe some of those guys made it. But, but listen, there was a genetic reason I look for calories. And now, I don't, I'm a logical woman. I know exercise is the cure to everything. I know good eating is the cure to everything. But every now and again, you will see me with a donut. By the way, I'm not the only person from my tribe. Does anybody see a problem with this slide? Apparently, there's there some other people that, have, uh, that are fighting irrational impulses. The part that you don't see is that they're waiting in their cars for 15 minutes to get a parking place closer to the escalator. 
right? So they don't have to walk across the parking lot. The fact is, is that we're dealing with less than a 5% difference in genome. We've broken down the human genome, and our nearest ancestor is the bonobo monkey. And we're dealing with less than a 5% difference. But that 5%, it's not quantity here, it's quality. That 5% is reason. It's our ability to preempt, to be logical, to make better choices. That's what that 5% is. So there are a couple of antidotes to complexity that I'm going to talk about today. I can't go into all of them, but I'm going to race through these really quickly. The most important one is our physiological adaptation. We now, for the first time in human history, can put a skull cap, cap on your head and watch what happens as we administer increasingly complex problems. Think about this. At no other time in human history could we watch what the brain was doing. Now we can. We can see what's going on. And we know that at a certain point, your left and right brain peter out. They flatline. They can't solve the problem without some other assistance. So one of the things that we've discovered is that in a thriving society, the left and the right brain can solve the problems and that there's knowledge and beliefs that coexist. But we hit this cognitive threshold. We've kind of exhausted the capability of the left and right brain. And suddenly, we become gridlocked, problems persist, they start growing larger and more dangerous, beliefs replace knowledge, and super memes appear. And then we collapse and rege we regenerate. By collapse, it doesn't mean we all die. It means we break into smaller groups with systems that we can deal with, that we can understand, like barter. Right? We can understand barter. We may not understand the tax code that we have, but if we all disintegrate and get back down to you have corn and I have cattle, let's make a trade that we both feel good about, we can understand that. We're now discovering, though, that there is a third form of problem solving that is evolving in the human brain, and scientists call this insight. If you think about it, we now have left, right, and insight that we can call upon. One way to think about the brain and how it solves problems is the left brain is it is, uses deconstruction. It starts out with this many solutions, and it goes down, 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 down. You get down to one or two, and you pick one. If it's the wrong one, you switch gears. The right side of the brain uses creative synthesis. That's I'm talking to you, and I notice a little sweat above your lip, and I know you're lying to me. By the way, all of you in this room are excellent liar detectors because liars represented a threat to your troop in earlier times. But insight is, you know, so, so the left side of the brain is like a grocery store where everything's neatly labeled. The right side of the brain is more like a showroom, furniture showroom, where there's a, there's a, a picture frame, a magazine, a piece of art, and a couch. Insight is like going into a warehouse and imagining what you want, and it pops out. Now, there have been lots of aha and in, in, uh, insightful moments throughout history. We kind of made these folklore. You know, Newton, the apple hitting him on the head and discovering gravity. Archimedes sitting in a tub and the water falling over the sides of the tub, and he discovered displacement. You know, we decided that those things were just sort of accidental. But oh no, oh no, they're not accidental. Actually, they're a traceable process in the brain. Insight is the process of organizing chaos in the brain and connecting two pieces of data that you've never connected uh, before in a novel way. We can actually watch the process occur in the brain. Now, I'm going to roll, in the interest of time, I'm going to roll through some of these slides. By the way, these slides are available, so you can just email me if you want a copy of the slides or the presentation. I know they're also taping this, so I'm going to kind of roll through this. But one of the things that we know about insight is it comes on like a freight train. You've all sat in meetings where you're in a conference room and you're trying to deal with a problem and somebody goes, I know, why don't we do this? And everybody turns around and says, how'd you come up with that? And the person says, I don't know. There's no traceability. It comes out of thin air. It comes very quickly. And it's not controversial. Everyone in the room knows it's a brilliant solution and immediately adopts it. So it, no fair saying, I've had an insight, you know, you guys should all agree with me and inside up with me, because usually it, it's painfully obvious, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, when, if you're a scientist in the room, you know that when you get to the point where you can predict an insight's going to occur, you're really on to something. 
And neuroscientists now know when you're going to use insight, 300 milliseconds before you're going to, because a small part of your brain called the ASTG lights up like a Christmas tree. So let me tell you how this works. I'm sitting in a lab. I'm watching. Person's got, you know, there's a bunch of people. They've all got uh, wires on, on their heads. And they're doing a bunch of problems. And the problems are getting increasingly complex, increasingly complex. Now they go into a high failure rate environment. They're failing the answer of every question. They cannot do the problem. And every now and again, we're watching and we'll say, he's going to have an insight in 300 milliseconds beforehand. That person will solve a problem way above their pay grade. We'll go in and we'll interview them and they'll say, I have no idea. Don't know how I came up with that. No traceability at all. By the way, everybody has insights. I, I write about a case in, in my own hometown where I live, live up near Big Sur, California, and we had a giant fire that was coming through. And uh, I was very worried about a friend of mine who had a house in the middle of the fire. And he calls me up and he said, I had an insight. And I said, what is that? And he says, I was sitting on my deck and I was saying goodbye to my house because I knew it was going to burn. It was a very, very sad moment for me. And all of a sudden, I started thinking about firewalls. Firewalls in, in general construction are generally two uh, walls of sheetrock. So he said, I had some sheetrock in my garage. So I took the sheetrock and I made a fire in my fireplace while I was saying goodbye to my house. And I started throwing the sheetrock in the fireplace. And it wouldn't burn. So he says, I got in my truck and I drove to Home Depot and I cleaned them out of sheetrock and I grabbed a bunch of laborers and I said, nail sheetrock to every part of the outside of my house. He said, it looked like a weird bunker, a space age bunker. He goes, we just took a nail gun and we covered the windows, the roof and everything. And I stood there as these ashes landed on the sheetrock and burned out. His was the only house saved. It was an insight. Is he a genius scientist? I don't think anybody would say that. But he had a moment, and we all have moments. Contractors have moments. We all have moments. How can we increase the probability of insights? Everybody's interested in catching the brain up. You know this, right? We're all falling behind. Interestingly enough, walking on uneven surfaces is one of the best brain workouts you can do because balancing, you know, walking is the art of falling forward. It's not that easy. That's why we wound up, after years of trying to teach robots to walk, we put them on wheels. We gave up. It's, it's cognitively challenging, and the brain works overtime to actually walk. So what do we do? We pave everything off, off, you know, over and make it smooth. No, get off the smooth surfaces. Consuming brain foods and supplements, and there's a lot of information in your packets, I noticed, on things that help facilitate and make the brain function better. Working in groups of four to nine. Do you have a board of directors? Do you have any committee that has more than nine people on it? You better get rid of some. Because we know that things like social loafing and things in politics and other issues, you're designed to operate in a troop of four to nine. That's when you have insights. That's when you make progress. Relaxation. There's also some information, I think, in, in these handouts that you have about how critical there, there seems to be a relationship. I'm just telling you what we know, state of the art at this point. There is a relationship between a relaxed state and an insight happening. And I get more emails than you can imagine about people saying, I have insights when I'm washing dishes. I have insights when I'm walking my dog. I have insights when I'm driving in my car. I have my insights very inconveniently when I'm in the shower and I convinced myself it was the hot water hitting my head, opening up blood vessels, perhaps. Uh, so there was a trail of water from my shower to my desk. So I, because if I don't write them down, by the way, they come and they go really fast. So if you have an insight, you better write it down. You better make some physical memory of it. Um, and increase in physical exercise. We all know. And look, I don't like this because there hasn't been an exercise invented that I like. Right. I need the um, donut eating lay around strategy, but we don't have that yet. But, but I will say that, that when you increase blood flow to the brain, you're more likely to have these insights. But the holy grail, remember what I said, it's connecting two pieces of content that you have in a way that you've never connected it before. And the holy grail here is brain fitness. The brain wants to accept information in a certain way, and we've now discovered that the brain wants to be warmed up 
before you have to deal with a very difficult problem or you have to learn something. And a lot of the work that I, I've talked about, I'm not going to have a lot of time to go into this today, but I will say that a lot of the work that's been done on brain fitness has come out of UCSF Medical Center, Dr. Mike Bersnick, who did some of the original pioneering work on brain plasticity. And one of the things he's discovered is, is that if the brain is warmed up, think about this. If you're going to go run a marathon, you don't just get up one morning and go run the marathon. You hydrate, you work out, you stretch. You know, unless you want a heart attack, you're just not going to get up and decide you're going to run a marathon. Your brain wants to be warmed up before it's exerted as well. And so one of the wonderful things that we've discovered from brain fitness, I want to give you a couple of statistics here, and I can never remember them, so you're going to have to forgive me for going to my, uh, my cheat cards here. But we've now given brain fitness to a number of schools in Jacksonville County. There were 23,000 grade school students who have now just played a little video game that warms up, that's designed by a neuroscientist to warm up all sides of their brain. They play that video game about 15 minutes in the morning before school starts. Those children now have four years and two, uh, excuse me, after four years, have two times the academic achievement. No change in textbooks, teachers, curriculum, anything. Just play a video game before school starts. You want a revolution in education? It's brain fitness. If it's hard for you and I to deal with, what, with the onslaught of data and information that we're having to cope with today, what do you think it's like to be eight years old? I think it's pretty overwhelming. And so we have to do something to assist and catch the brain up. Now, one of the interesting studies is that they gave brain fitness tools to retirement homes just to see what would happen. Again, three or four years later, they've discovered now that, that and insurance companies are all looking into this, is, is that they were having fewer car accidents. And the reason is because their peripheral vision was being warmed up. And it was because of a lack of peripheral vision that they were having these car wrecks. And so now insurance companies are looking into putting brain fitness on, and then if you'll play it for 15 minutes before you start your car up, they'll give you a discount if you're over the age of 65 or 70 as well. The Mayo Clinic says that brain fitness improves memory at least one decade's worth and may fend against diseases like Alzheimer's and other degenerative diseases as well. Arming the brain is one solution, mitigation is another. So again, according to Dr. Yarnir Baryam, a complex environment is one where there are more wrong solutions than right ones. As complexity increases, your odds of making the right choice, they get poorer. We become basically incompetent pickers. That's nobody's fault. The people that were going after Hillary Clinton for the Benghazi issue, I said, God, are you really, are you kidding me? Do you know how many millions of communications come in from embassies all over the world? It's completely understandable that the most important one didn't get to the top of the heap. I don't believe that's anyone's fault. But here is the key. We have business models for high rates of failure. Where I live, it's called venture capital. Venture capitalists are not, they don't, they're not, uh, they're not experts at success. They're experts at failure. For every 100 companies that they do diligence on as best they can, better than anybody else, better than our government, that for every 100 companies, they're only expecting 10 or 15 to do well. But every venture capitalist I know does just fine with those odds. How about your company? What if you only had a 10% success rate? Can you succeed with a 10% success rate? I say you can. I say you can if you adopt the right model for a high failure rate environment. But you can't if you use a linear model. Let me use the Gulf oil spill as an example. Everybody remembers a Gulf oil spill. We're watching mushroom clouds of oil come out of the, the earth. I thought it was like a science fiction movie. I didn't think they were going to be able to close it up. And I knew a lot of the scientists that were down there, and they were saying, we, we may have really done it this time. But if you remember... Do you remember that our first solution was we got all the smart people in a room and we decided we were going to put a concrete box on the hole? And then we waited 30 days and we went, no, nope, that didn't work. Now remember, we're in a high failure rate environment where there are more wrong solutions than right ones. So we pick one solution, we wait 30 days. 
Next thing we were going to do is drill off the side uh, from uh, underneath, and we were going to siphon off some of the oil so it wouldn't get to the surface. That didn't work. The third solution was static kill. It did work, and it did hold. But imagine if static kill had been solution number 87 or 129. We would still be watching these Hiroshima-looking clouds of oil come up on the Gulf oil spill. Now let's compare this to the rescue of the Chilean miners. Do you remember this? These guys were trapped for 69 days in the bowels of the earth. The Chilean government did not pursue one rescue plan and see if that was going to work and go to another. They knew that they had a time-sensitive, mission-critical situation. So they pursued 16 rescue plans in tandem. And the 16, as they moved further down the road, turned to 15, turned to 14, as many of these rescue plans proved that they didn't work. In other words, what I'm saying to you is you have to invest in solutions and products like a venture capital list inside your company. And if there's anybody saying, no, this is the one that's going to win, they're wrong because you're in a high failure rate environment. You, no amount of due diligence in the world is going to allow you to make, be the right picker and to pick the right solution. Diversification of solutions uh, and raising the threshold for failure, making it acceptable, is a key to prevailing in a high failure rate environment. Anyone who's a biologist knows that any drive toward singularity is a drive toward extinction. And so you know that these pressures to be more efficient can create a great deal of vulnerability as you drive the company to singular departments, singular methods, singular technologies, and you make yourselves more vulnerable to collapse. The example that I frequently use is centralized versus distributed systems. One might be cost effective, right? It's, it's more cost effective to have one accounting department. In fact, the most cost effective thing is to have one person in the one accounting department. But if that person has a medical emergency, nobody get, in the whole company gets paid that week. So you got to be careful as you're going to streamline and cut costs, particularly in this economy. I wonder, is your, are your companies geared toward a high failure rate environment? Or are you doing same old business that you did before? I work a, uh, a great deal with Dole Fresh Foods. I work with corporations all around the world. I would tell you Dole is a classic example of an organization that completely switched their corporate culture. They began investing in solutions and told their department managers that if they didn't have a lot of solutions that were failing early, failing fast, that they weren't acting like a VC. So in other words, once a year they say, give us all your ideas, even the ones that are long shots, and let's invest a little down the road, like the Chilean miner strategy. They have a fail-quick culture. They use this language. They go, all right, I don't think that's going to work, but fail quick. So it costs us the least amount of money. It's a phenomenal culture because everyone's relaxed and no one feels like they're getting blamed. No one's worried of losing their job. They've created a complete revolution in terms of their culture. They have distributed business units that operate independently and are not all reporting into centralized cor uh, corporate so that if one fails, it has the le does the least amount of damage to the others. And they have mission-critical redundancy. They've identified those aspects of their business that would be a calamity if they were to fail, as opposed to trim a little bit too far. So in summary, and I think I pretty much have used my time and then some, there is a natural growing gap between accelerating complexity and evolution and the limitations of the human organism. Look, at some point, we have to come to grips with, a, with what this biological space seat, suit needs to thrive. They did a, 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 um, a poll not too long ago to ask people if they had more in common with their computers and their cell phones than they did with other humans. How do you think that came out? People feel they can't live without their computers and their cell phones, but they can live without other humans. We've made some kind of a weird and disturbing turn in our civilization, and we have to get back to the fact that what we have in common is with other living organisms on the planet. When you think your computer is more important than air and food, we have a problem. And that may be very well with what some of you are dealing with. The gap leads to gridlock and belief-based behavior and policy. 
And there are certain tools that will enable you to prevail in a high failure rate environment. Think like a venture capitalist, fast adaptation using neuroscience as much as you can. By the way, if you're interested, if you've got a pen out, you can go to Posit Science. I have no affiliation with this company at all, P-O-S-I-T. And you can play the game, uh, the games that warm up your brains. Don't, don't use the ones that gaming companies sent, uh, you know, advertise and everything. Use one that has been developed by a neuroscientist because they're specifically developed to warm up all the parts of your brains. And you have mitigation strategies and tools, like working like a VC, working in smaller groups, uh, and, and other kinds of tactics as well. So do I have time to take Q&A? We actually, we actually do. So we, uh, we, do. we have okay. a couple extra minutes. Anybody brave that wants to ask a question? <laughs> there we go. Has anyone in academics or uh, government studied the response to brain-stimulating nutraceuticals with regard to uh, global b brain problem solving? Uh, I think the question is, uh, has anybody studied these brain pharmaceuticals that, that make you... Excuse me? Nutraceuticals. nutraceuticals that, that make you smarter. Um, there, there are lots of studies about the nutraceuticals that, that help the brain function better. You know, the brain, we, we understand that what helps the brain function better is blood, oxygen, nutrients, all the normal things that you would expect. But there are certain kinds of chemicals and chemistry in the brain that allow the synapses to work in the brain more efficiently and allow those synapses to access information and data at a better rate. And I will post those on my website that you can go to some of those studies that indicate that. There's no question that uh, there are nutraceuticals that do facilitate brain function. Uh, we're just learning about this. You know, people, the number one complaint that people had about my book was that at the back end, I didn't write enough about what we knew about insight and how to uh, promote insights and, and, and allow the brain to function better. And, and I said, well, it's a nonfiction book. I can't make stuff up. I put in there what we know. And what we know, by the way, is pathetically little. Pathetically little. I, I, we're just starting on this uh, adventure. In fact, I was in Washington, D.C. at the Brookings Institute, and I said, what we need is, you know, we created NASA for the exploration of outer space. What, now we need a department of the exploration of inner space because whatever country allows uh, absorption of content to occur better and thinking to occur better, they win the economic war. Forget tariffs. That, that's old economics. We need to get out ahead of the problem. And getting out ahead of the problem is, an, is, is absorption, is absorption of content and being able to test the veracity of it and bring the content that's relevant to bear on our decisions. If we make better decisions, I'm pretty sure you win the economic war. So I'd like to see a national program like that, and I was just back there speaking on that. And on the subject of brain nutraceuticals, take in the healthy aging session where we will actually be talking about that specific subject. We'll have time for one more question. Any burning question? We've got one. It's a, oh, good question. Next you want my phone number. Uh, the, by the way, please do, if we don't have, I, I ran my time a little bit over today and we can't take a lot of questions. Please do come by. I, I, you can tell I'm, I'm a friendly sort of person. And no question is out of bounds and no thought that you have is out of bounds because I learned so much. You know, when you go out and you meet with the public, you learn so much. You have information that I would like to have. So I hope that you will stop by. I'll be at the sunset deck at 5.30, but I'll probably get there around 5 o'clock. And there is my website, RebeccaCosta.com. If you don't like reading, uh, the book is available in audio form. It's also available in Kindle form. And also, there are so many videos that I, I think we must have 50 or 100 videos out. So you can just watch the videos. Put them up on your computer while you're working and watch the videos, and you'll get some takeaways.
So thank you, Rebecca. That's really insightful and uh, great information. I do have a quick question. I'm Kevin Williams from Pure Branding, and we do a lot in helping organizations like this to distill information so that people are willing to listen and hear it. And what you're talking about is that this idea of empirical evidence versus beliefs. Um, in uh, Daniel Kahneman, I'm sure you know him, uh, Think Fast, Think Slow, that book that was... Uh, it's a great book. Great book. He talks about fast brain, slow brain. And that fast brain is the way we navigate the world. A lot of information at once. And then slow brain is when we get into the empirical evidence and everything else shuts down while we're having that kind of conversation with ourselves, looking at the facts. If we're absorbing all this information today, there's so much facts out there about, for instance, you know, the audience we have here today and all the products that they can pre uh, present to the public. How can people possibly navigate or absorb that kind of information in a factual based empirical evidence way without first applying their beliefs or their... Uh, you know, we call that that fast brain, that intuition, which is based on beliefs, to make some assessments to judge the situation and then start getting empirical. I think you really have to start, uh, you know, I, uh, I speak to grammar schools, I speak to Harvard University, I speak to Washington, D.C. I always start with, well, what do you think you are? You, you know, look, you're, you're a living organism. That's what you have in common with the rest of the living world. And as a living organism, there are some things you can do that will facilitate and make you function better, and there are other things that you do that make you function terribly. If you don't start there, if you don't reconnect people with the fact that they're trapped in a biological spacesuit, and it doesn't matter if it's President Obama or you and I, we're overwhelmed. Everybody's overwhelmed. Too much data, and you saw the four Vs, right? Volume, variety, veracity, and you know, you, you, we're, we're, everybody's dealing with it. So I think you have to start with reconnecting people to their, bio, their biological origins. And so when I start with grammar school kids, I start telling stories about when we lived in the cave and the fact that we only have a 5% gen genome difference from a bonobo monkey. I would argue there are lots more healthy bonobo monkeys than there are humans, right? That 5%, it's logic, it's reason. But right now, if, if Ed Wilson was sitting on the stage with me, he would tell you that we've built a society that caters to the lowest instruments of our genetic inheritance, our instincts and those we share with the rest of the animal kingdom. But we, we are not catering to the highest instruments, which is our ability to look at empirical data and my ability to make a choice not to eat a donut. Now, I take, took that a, a step further, right, because I know better now, and I know that I'll be tempted. I, I'm not able to say no donuts the rest of my life. I'm weak. So you probably don't want to pay any attention to anything I say, right? Um, but so I can't make that rule. So what I did was I made food rules. And, I, and my food rule is I'm allowed to have a donut any time that I'm at a conference. I can have one donut. Well, I don't do that many conferences right now because I'm writing a book and doing other things. So uh, and that's going to be three, five donuts a year that I'm going to be doing. Uh, that's not going to hurt me. Uh, I, I know a doctor who says that he's going to eat, uh, uh, he's allowed to have as many tortilla chips on that first basket they give you at the Mexican food restaurant. He's allowed to have as many tortilla chips in the first basket. When they refill it, zero. He's also allowed to have a hot dog anytime he's at a major league baseball game. Well, he only gets out to two a year. So you can put in rules, compensatory behavior, those kinds of things. But you're going to have to start with connecting people to their biology. It's the reason we drink soda. It's the reason we don't exercise. It's the reason we killed PE in schools. It's the reason, you know, I mean, it's the reason we're polluting water. I, I get back to any, everyone will tell you I can't live without my cell phone. But there's an illusion they can live without clean water. How did that happen? That's kind of what you're struggling with at a very base level, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have to tell us about texting and driving. That would be my argument. I mean, when that came out, I was kind of embarrassed for all of us that we got to make a law for that. We should have been able to figure that out. But we've drifted so far away from our biological origins that this is the problem. There is a conflict between beliefs and facts, and it's tough to introduce facts about biology 
when people don't even think they're a biological organism anymore. Thank you very much. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, so Rebecca Costa.